Good morning, Nathan. Hello, Jonathan. <laughs> I just got I just got this. I'm about to make some frozen burritos. Nice. You should deep fry them. They come out really good. I know those because I've tried it. So are we the only ones on right now? Nobody else on? Yeah. Oh, meeting doesn't start about 10 minutes. Actually, I think it's like 5 minutes. Something like that. Yeah, let's see. Screen, yeah, 5 minutes. Dude, this is the last class. <laughs> what did you do on your test? On the test? Um... I did good on the multiple choice questions for the general knowledge one. I haven't started the EFI one yet. Oh, I, I got, uh, I got an 85 on the EFI one. Uh, ben hasn't graded the general knowledge one yet, so I don't know about the write-in questions yet. Yeah, the EFI one, I got 85%. You got what? I got an 85%. Oh, that's not bad. Are they all multiple choice for the E5 one? Yeah, all multiple choice. Okay, that'll make it easier. Because then I won't have to wait for him to grade it to see what my grade is. finger on the cardboard box yesterday. It was like a paper cut, but worse. So I saw some games that, uh, oh, one game that's particularly new that seemed pretty cool. Have you seen uh, SnowRunner? No, I haven't. It's like, it's like an off-road uh, trucking simulator. It's pretty cool looking. Oh. I'll have to, is it on the PS4? going to be on the PS4? Yeah, it's on the PS4. I ordered it on Amazon. It should be here tomorrow. Nice. And I also ordered a new controller since I was using the older version of the controller which oh. doesn't allow for wired setups so like when you have it just plugged in and leave it plugged in it's constantly using the wireless battery so it it only it's like using it while it's charging but it keeps wanting to disconnect back and forth and it just constantly drains the battery oh I don't know which so I, guess version, then, yeah. I don't know which version of the controller I have. I know I can just plug it into the You can tell by checking the the light bar if the light bar is on the touchpad, it's the newer version. Oh. I have an old version then. Like you see a light through the touchpad, you, it's the newer one. So I ordered a newer version because the newer version has US the USB connection to where you can use it wired and it won't use the wireless battery. Oh wow. Fucking cost me like sixty five bucks worth though. Dude, that's only five bucks more than the normal than the regular PS4 controller. <laughs> I know, cause it was uh, my nineteenth birthday. My grandma asked what asked what I wanted. I said a PS4 controller, <laughs> <laughs> and she got me a game with it. So I was like, okay, dope. Yeah, and right now, if you want to get the. Uh, Charlie. The first version of SnowRunner, 
the first game that they made was Mud Runner. It's like thirty bucks on Amazon for the PS4. Wow. It's all about that oh, there it is. simulator. You want farming simulator? Go with farming simulator. <laughs> what farming simulator is free right now? Yeah, it's PS. The PS. Yes, but who would play? Who would play that piece of crap? <laughs> you, Charlie. Dan, you would. Uh, no, I surprisingly wouldn't. I on, on PC, GTA Five is free. You seem like the kind of person that would Yes, I'm, like I'm aware, but the uh, Epic Games website and, like, app has been down for the past few days. I, I just got in today. The app's working just fine. Yeah. Hmm. Let me try them. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I like playing Farming Simulator. Shut up. <laughs> you red I like, I like Carmichael. <laughs> I like car mechanic simulator. It is far superior. That is true. That's true. Car mechanic simulator is so much more superior. Farming simulator is just calming. Minecraft is calming too. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. The recording. And let me just say, as it sits right now with our fall schedule, we are still going to have hands-on online classes. Um, it's hands-on and online in that what we're going to do is all the full-time instructors and a few of the part-time or adjunct instructors are going to teach. Um, uh, basically, uh, they're gonna, we're going to split our classes up into two groups of students. We're gonna have a max class size between 16 to 18 students, and we'll have an A group and a B group. And almost all the lecture information, just like you guys have been doing this semester, will be loaded online for you to um, for you to to you know learn from and work on, and uh, that type of stuff. Um, however, uh, when you come to class, you'll work, uh, you'll have like a short review and then you'll go straight to lab. So you'll end up with the same amount of shop time you would have normally had, but you'll only go to school for half the time. So let's say you were in a class that was meeting on Tuesday and Thursday nights. Well, if you're in group A, maybe you're only coming to school on Tuesday nights and group B is only coming to school on Thursday nights and then the lecture materials online. Um, so with that, like myself, I'm teaching skill and speed development. I'm going to be teaching engine performance, the 332 class. And now I'm also going to be teaching engine repair first five weeks as it sits right now. Um, that being said, you know, the, the situation is forever changing, right? It depends on um, what happens with the virus and if there's a resurgence and, and many factors. So, um, you know, as it sits right now, we're still teaching hands-on classes. We're not teaching quite as many, um, and we're doing more stuff online. So all of our basic AT100 auto classes will now be online um, for the fall. So that's that's where we're at, and we'll get more into that in the, at the end of stuff. I do want to get into our technical information, and our first thing up is nitrous oxide, right? So what do we do, um, you know, what, what are we doing on a nitrous oxide um, system? So I'll put myself there at the, at the bottom and we'll, we'll get going. All right, so nitrous oxide or NOS, right? NOS is kind of a name brand system. Um, what are the benefits? Well, we've seen from the movies and TV <laughs> that, hey, you can, you can make more power uh, with NOS but how does, how does that work exactly? Well, basically it's gonna give the engine a whole lot more oxygen. How does it do that? Well, it's injected as a liquid, but then it changes to a vapor. So there's a, there's a change of state that happens. And what that does is it absorbs a lot of temperature. So it makes like the air going in the engine 
really, really, really cold and it adds a whole lot of extra air. Um, I have on here bottle warmers and blankets are used to keep the nitrous bottle pressure up and um, there's all kinds of uh, extra stuff, but essentially nitrous, by giving the engine nitrous, you're giving it a whole lot of extra oxygen. Now, what is it exactly? Well, it's a cryogenic liquid, right? Um, and it's set to boil at 128 degrees below zero. So once you take it out of the bottle, once you release it out in the atmosphere, it instantly goes from a liquid to a gas. And as it does that, it absorbs a whole lot of temperature. Now this is the same nitrous oxide that you would get at the dentist's office here, right? So there's one of my favorite Seinfeld episodes there where he's getting gassed from the from Watley there, um, but it's, it's the same stuff, okay? So when you feed it in the engine, in a, in a liquid state as it's changing into a gas, it's giving the engine a whole lot of extra oxygen. What you have to do with it is you have to then, of course, add a bunch of fuel to it, because if you don't, the engine's now going to be way too lean, right? And that's one of the dangers. But if I'm able to give the engine you know, more air or specifically more oxygen, right? If I'm giving the engine more oxygen and then I can give the engine more, um, more fuel or hydrocarbons with that, well, basically I'm gonna get a whole lot more combustion or performance from it, right? It's almost like why, why I put it in the group with power adders is it's, you're, you're essentially getting more power out of the same displacement because you're increasing the concentration of oxygen. It's not breathing in 20% oxygen. It might be breathing in 50% oxygen. And so as long as I give it more fuel, I'm gonna get that much more power from it. Okay, so with that, uh, like I said, we have to give it some fuel along with the nitrous. Now there's two ways to do that. Um, there's what we call a wet system where we, we t actually tap into the fuel system and we spray in extra fuel in a nozzle um, with the nitrous. And then there's also what we call a dry system. A dry system like this guy uh, right here just sprays in the nitrous and we're going to use the vehicle's existing fuel delivery system, ex existing fuel injectors to provide extra enrichment. So maybe when the nitrous goes on, the fuel pressure and the fuel rail goes way up and then it uh, delivers extra fuel, something like that. So you have dry systems and wet systems. Both systems though, by one way or another, you have to give the engine extra fuel with the nitrous. Otherwise it's just gonna go way lean and it's just gonna burn everything up, right? So that's one of the things that you see wrong in the movies is that you usually see them just turning on the nitrous, but there's no like, well, what, what about the extra fuel, right? So um, a dry system would require the fuel injectors that are capable of delivering that extra fuel, right? And so there's usually a solenoid or something on the fuel pressure regulator to, to make sure that it, that that happens. And there's, if you have a fuel injected engine with a mass airflow sensor, you got to um, pay attention to where you're injecting the nitrous in the engine. Um, the, probably the best thing to go with would be a, some type of kit that is designed for your vehicle so you get most of the parts of the equation right. What I found even with kits though is a lot of times they leave a lot to be desired and you're still piecing together a lot of things. So, so with that, if we were to plumb out the um, a nitrous uh, system, what we would have is you would have the nitrous bottle and it's gonna be connected to the nitrous solenoid. And this bottle is likely to have some type of warming blanket on it to keep its pressure correct. But that's gonna be plumbed to a solenoid. And then the, the solenoid, when it turns on, it's gonna then deliver nitrous to your air intake system. Now we're gonna have some type of other 
solenoid doing something to um, provide extra, um, you know, fuel pressure or something so that the fuel injection system can deliver fuel normally through the injectors, but give you extra fuel when you're on the nitrous. You might also have um, a vent solenoid here so that when you go to run your nitrous, you can do a purge and that means expel any oxygen out of here so that when you hit the button in your drag race or whatever, everything's primed up here and nitrous is ready to spray out of the, the, the nitrous jet. So that would be kind of your... Here's the fun question. Yeah. Can I set up nitrous on the pit bike? You would have to have a system that's sized down enough and you have to have a way to add additional fuel, right? Well, I, I know they make like 12 ounce nitrous bottles. Right. So, it's not just the storage thanks. though. It's, it's like getting the right jets and stuff. And so because it's such okay. a small engine, it's not impossible, but it, you know, it'd be, it'd be tricky trying to get the right amounts and not blowing stuff up. But where, where there's a will, there's a way. Okay. So I mentioned the nitrous bottle heaters, the blankets. The idea is that even though the nitrous is, is liquid in the bottle, you, you got to keep it under pressure somewhere around 900 PSI to keep it, um, uh, to keep that, man, maintain that, that constant pressure so that you don't end up with varying amounts of nitrous entering the engine, right? If you start to run out of nitrous, you're, you're essentially ch changing your air fuel ratio. So it'll go way, way rich on you uh, in that period of time. And so Fast and Furious is just trash because they don't cover up their nitrous bottles at all. Right, I mean, well, if your bottle's full, it's fine. But as your bottle starts to run low, then you're going to have problems. But, man, that bottle's awful, awful pretty in there. You want to look at it, so it's not fun to see a big blanket and stuff on it. But if you're really racing, you know, having the blanket on there is, is nice because it keeps the bottle nice and hot and keeps that pressure consistent. One thing to think about nitrous is that unlike a supercharger or a turbocharger, or, you know, like you continually have to refill the nitrous bottle. You have nitrous in there that's you know a certain amount and you're going to run through it um i remember the semester we were putting nitrous on the infinity you know i i went to harris gases and air gas and and tognatis and it took me uh, two-thirds of the semester before they had nitrous available again for me to get my bottles filled um so it is a it is a consumable thing that go that goes away uh, when you're done using it, you want to turn the bottle off so you're not wasting it, right? And it's not ridiculously expensive, but it's not cheap as well. I want to say it cost me $50 or so to fill up a bottle like you, like you see on the screen right here um, at that time. So, you know, there there is a cost to using it. All right. One thing I have noticed in the racing community right now, sim yeah. racing wheels have gone out of stock and their prices have skyrocketed. Oh, I bet. I bet. So like a lot of industries are really hurting, right? However, um, even though a lot of industries are really, are really hurting, um, you know, some industries like uh, sim racing and others are, are doing uh, pretty well. So it's just, it's a totally different, economy now um yeah i was i was looking for a shifter for my g29 and they were extremely overpriced and everything uh, everything mainly for the g29 was out of stock yeah. and i looked for g27 shifters because they're compatible mm -hmm. and since they were discontinued the ones that weren't even auctions they were like 120 wow I even got I even got to the point where where I asked Luke if I could buy his off of him his shifter. <laughs> well, ours is, ours is a G twenty five, so it I don't is? know if that's compatible. Like a G twenty nine is a much newer wheel, right? Um, our wheels from like two thousand seven yeah. or eight. Um, uh, and I I don't know. I'm thinking that like I re I really kind of want to go back. I don't have a shifter on our wheel right now because I can't. 
I can't find where I put it, and it had a weird mounting, the Fanatec shifter I have. Anyways. Um, oh, the Fanatec right. ones are expensive right now. They're, they're at least like So 200. the one I have is kind of a funky one that re, it had like, if you bought the wheel and you had their mount thing, it had these two pins. And anyways, um, yeah, some industries are doing really well. Uh, sim racing is, is definitely one of those. All right, back, back to nitrous though. Um, so what nitrous injection in my mind um, and from my experience has been a little safer because we're plumbing an extra a fuel delivery system and it seems like it's a little bit more direct. I'm not relying on something else giving me more fuel at the right time. Um, this is a little bit more straightforward, but you're arguably not giving, getting as homogeneous or as well mixed of a, of a fuel mixture with the nitrous um, as, as maybe a dry system. Um, I do think that wet systems are more popular. And like I said, I always felt like they were a little bit safer. So here we have two solenoids, one used for the nitrous and the other ones used for the fuel. And then we could have an additional purge solenoid or something on there. Um, so with that, let's see how we would plumb this together. So I added this box this time because now what we're going to do is we're going to take, um, let me get this going. We're going to take fuel from the, from the gas tank and we're going to run that um, to, a, to a fuel solenoid. So the fuel is going to go in one side of the uh, nozzle, the injection nozzle. And then we're also going to have our nitrous come through here. So it goes through a solenoid. And I'm going to add a purge solenoid as well. So like if you watch stuff and you go to the racetrack and you see people blowing nitrous out into the atmosphere, it's they're purging their system. They're making sure that the all the tubes, they don't just have air sitting in there. They have nitrous, they're ready to go. Um, Is that so, like super bad for the environment? Uh, no, it's not. It's, uh, I don't think people are blowing out enough nitrous to cause an issue. And honestly, I'm not sure what the environmental ramifications of nitrous oxide are. I don't think they're much more harmful than regular car exhaust. So, but there, there's, so you'll see people where they hit the button and it, it you know, psh, comes out and, you know, maybe it, it goes to the front of their car. A lot of guys like, to, like it to come out like by the windshield so you can see it when you're within, within the car. And I got to admit, it is, it is pretty awesome. Um, so they'll, they'll have that, that purge set up so that the nitrous is primed and ready to go. But so you, now you have two systems. You have the, the vehicle's regular fuel delivery system that might go through a carburetor or injectors. And now you have this separate fuel delivery system providing additional fuel to an injector nozzle to, uh, to deliver fuel with the nitrous as it enters the engine. And so that, and so you'll have jets inside this nozzle to change the control, how much fuel you're giving the engine and how much nitrous is going into the engine. So when they talk about it seems like a simple setup compared to things like turbos and superchargers and stuff. It, it is a lot simpler, right? It's, it's less expensive and it's simpler to put on definitely than a, than a turbo or something. But, um, you know, you put the turbo on once you don't have to get the bottle refilled. Right. And it's always there and it's progressive and how it delivers the power, right? Where this you know, it's when you hit the button and when you don't hit the button. That, that being said, that's kind of um, what's exciting about it, right? Nothing else gives you that, that instant increase in power when you hit with the, with the touch of a button that nitrous does. And it's just darn, darn exciting. So here's some of these um, nozzles, injector nozzles that you can see that mix the fuel with the nitrous going in the engine. And when you take off, um, you, you take these, uh, you take the lines off and inside here there's jets that you can change to control how much fuel and how much nitrous you're giving. And, and they'll, they'll talk about things like, oh, this is a, 
uh, 50 shot or a 100 shot. And the idea is that that's going to add 50 horsepower or 100 horsepower. Now that's not really how it comes out, but you know, the bigger the shot of nitrous you're getting, the more power you should make. Um, if you're doing this type of work to make sure that you have your ratios um, uh, correct, um, I would recommend that you um, I would recommend that you monitor your air fuel ratio uh, as you are um, uh, run a nitrous because the big danger is that you're going to end up going too lean. If you go too lean, you're going to burn up your engine real fast. All right, let's clear these drawings. I I remember last week we were talking about. Uh, Mad Max and power at the push of a button kind of thing. Yeah. With with nitrous, it's obvious. But I did go back and look up uh, twin charging systems again because I was talking about them a lot, and yeah. I went down a rabbit hole. And <laughs> Audi's Audi's system for their SUV that uses twin charging, it turns on and off the supercharger at certain RPMs. So wouldn't it work just like that? Hmm. I guess so. If they're turning on and off a supercharger, it must be some type of an electric supercharger. And they would have to have some type of way for the air to enter the engine when the supercharger is not spinning, right? Yeah, it, it so, uses a bypass um, valve that, uh, that turns okay. on and off. Yeah, because you, you, you can't have that supercharger. Through. The problem with the Mad Max deal is you have the supercharger the 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 rotors were right in the middle, right? So there'd be no way for the air and fuel to enter the engine with the with the supercharger um, uh, rotors not rotating in inside there, right? Um, so you'll see guys that build like Mag Max tribute cars that have the supercharger that can engage and disengage. What they have typically done is actually gutted out the inside of the supercharger so it doesn't actually have rotors in it. So it can engage and when it engages because it's spinning the gears and stuff, it makes a whine noise and everything. Um, and it seems awesome, but it's not really giving them more power. Um, anyways, yeah, you'd have to have a way to get the air in the motor. Um, when it comes to- like, Yeah, I, I just go to the point of defending that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but power at the push cool. of a button. Uh, nitrous, nitrous does that. So you can see a system here that is a wet system. It's got the two solenoids. One is for the fuel and one is for the nitrous so that it delivers both additional fuel and, and nitrous to the engine. Um, that's off of like a, a Dodge Neon or something right there that's all plumbed in there. Um, so again, it is power at the at the touch of a button, uh, which is pretty cool. They also make some setups where they have special injector cups. So it goes right, right along the, the fuel injector, which is pretty cool to give you good atomization. The bottom side of the intake manifold to kind of hide a lot of the nitrous plumbing. So there's a lot of like lower plate systems um, available that go right underneath the carburetor and stuff like that. Um, and then I've been mentioning power at the push of a button, but really there's some uh, complications there in that all of a sudden, if you go, you know, from running normal to now the engine's getting a whole lot more air uh, and, and fuel, right? That's a big surge of power on the engine. So you, you want to time it at the, at the right point. Um, what really works well is now they have progressive nitrous controllers where they can adjust how they feed in the nitrous so they're not shocking the engine with such a, a great um, additional workload on it all at once. And you can adjust that for like your launch, like I'd only want so much nitrous as I'm in first gear and then I can handle more in second gear in full power and third gear, that type of thing. So. Um, with a programmable nitrous controller, you can that set seems, how much nitrous the engine is gonna get. Yeah, that seems helpful because I, I know that people have started to test the new Corvette and it doesn't like nitrous in first gear, but it loves it in second. 
I could see that. Re remember, uh, like, you know, it, you only have so much traction out. available. And, and think of how quickly that engine probably revs to its red line in first gear anyways, right? You're not going to be able to to do much there. It's usually once you get into, like, you know, third gear, fourth gear, where you can really hit, you know, pour on the nitrous and really have a pull for you. So Yeah, because when they were testing it and they did it in first, it hit the red line in first, completely missed second, and uh, it slowed down a bit and then shifted into third. Yeah, I, I can and see that. They, it a lot did of times, though, you might, nitrous, drag strip. you might see nitrous on a car, and it's more for the look and the style than anything else. So you guys mentioned the lack of bottle heaters and stuff like that. A lot of times that's for the look of things than anything else. Um, and may, maybe the occasional use. Um, so what are the benefits of nitrous? Well, um, colder, denser intake charges, right? Um, I like the picture of Paul Walker's. Yeah, yeah, that's there. like this, this to me, this is what really made it famous for a lot of people. And is you know, cheesy as this movie is, it really did make a resurgence in the car community um not which, to mention they sh upshifted like nine times in that oh yeah they were driving semi-truck 18 speed transmissions i think because that's how many times <laughs> this scene in particular for you know he has his computer comes up says danger to manifold like he's putting so much pressure in the manifold and then a uh a piece of um like diamond plate sheet metal on the floor flies off for some reason and starts sparking on the ground. So it's completely ridiculous, but it was a fun movie nonetheless. Um, so colder, denser intake charge, right? We're getting more oxygen going in the intake. What does that mean? It means that we're going to have to provide more fuel with that. So I'll put uh, HCs over here for hydrocarbons or fuel. So we got to give it the additional fuel. And what does that, what does that do for us? It gives us increased rate of combustion, right? The combustion happens faster, but it also happens a lot stronger, right? Um, so we have more push pushing down on the pistons. Um, and so we're going to get a lot more power from that. Uh, we're going to get more torque. And remember that horsepower is a function of torque and RPM. So you do get uh, more horsepower as well, but it's all about we're pushing down on the pistons harder. And so that's why we get that big surge or big increase of torque. Now, because the rate of combustion, the quickness that it is burning, because that speeds up significantly, because we're adding more fuel and more, more oxygen, this is going to require us to retard or back off the ignition timing so we don't get into detonation. So another thing that those nitrous controllers can do is you, when, as you feather in the nitrous, you're backing off the ignition timing so you don't get into a detonation um, mode. So things to think about. Um, nitrous doesn't like platinum spark plugs. It tends to blow the platinum right off there. You're going to need high octane fuel when you're running nitrous because you're going to be pushing the engine closer to detonation zones. Um, a couple notes on assembly of the lines. You don't want to be putting Teflon tape on things. It's not compatible with that. Um, the valve in the bottle needs to be up, not down. And the bottle should be pointing forward. And sometimes you'll be at car shows and things and you'll look at the way they've mounted their bottle and it's completely wrong. Um, so you can see that they don't even really use their nitrous system. I've seen many cars that have a system all plumbed up there and it doesn't actually have a it doesn't actually work or the bottle's not actually filled. So um, a, few, uh, a few other things that I should have on here that maybe got cut off if I put Paul Walker's uh, uh, Eclipse picture on there is that when it comes to um, uh, things like uh, spark plugs, you would want a colder, just like we said for turbocharging and colder, plugs, right? Colder spark plugs, because we're adding a whole lot more uh, heat to the combustion process. And I'm also going to say, watch your air fuel um, ratio to make sure you're not going too lean, right? I would like to still maintain somewhere around a 12 to 1 air fuel ratio 
um, you know, at the, at the highest uh, to make sure I don't go go lean and burn up the engine. And I have uh, one you question. Know, if you really were building an engine, yeah, give me just one second. If you're really going to build an engine okay. for nitrous, ideally having forged components like forged pistons and good connecting rods and stuff, good bearings would be really important. Also, starting with an engine with slightly lower compression ratio, like an engine that's built for a turbo or a supercharger, typically will handle nitrous well, right? Okay, go ahead with your question. Okay. Go ahead. Being <laughs> that a can of ether would make the engine run more lean, would it work to make my pit bike startup easier since it struggles on startup and all that? Yeah, ether or starting fluid right, right into the area by faster. the air filter. Yes, you can. Um, you might okay. want to take the air filter off so you're not washing all the, uh, if it's an oil air filter, you're not washing all the oil out of the air filter and you're not deteriorating the filter media. But yeah, that's what you'd want to do to get that thing started up for sure. Now, okay. I thought you were going to ask me the question that um, m one of my students asked me a long time ago that I never forgot. Uh, I actually had a student uh, in the early 2000s, so it's right after that movie came out. Uh, he was running nitrous in his Honda Civic and, uh, you know, basically burned up all his spark plugs and all, uh, and they had like weird spots on them. And, um, but nitrous was getting kind of expensive for him. And, he, and he's like, well, can I just steal my, my grandfather's on oxygen? Can I just steal his oxygen tank and dump that oxygen? In oh, there? my God. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't yeah. know if your grandpa would appreciate that. But um, that would give the engine more oxygen. But because it's not having a change of state, because it's not like cooling the charge, it's going to push it much faster into a detonation mode. So it's not just the increased oxygen. It's the, um, the, the secret to the success of nitrous oxide is also the, um, the, the coolness, the fact that it cools the intake charge. In fact, you'll see people yeah, with turbos, they, they might spray nitrous exteriorly on the outside of their intercoolers because it does absorb a ton of heat as, as the nitrous comes off, uh, sprays out. So very much like- Yeah, because I was thinking of when I was gonna system. change I was thinking of when I was going to change my suspension on my pit bike that I would buy a can of ether as well, since it's really a pain to start that bike. Yes. And yeah. I was just wondering Always how good to have some well it would fluid in the work. garage. Okay. Um, so now we're changing gears a bit, and we're talking about rotary engines. And uh, for many years, it, it changed the game of internal combustion. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's, um, its disadvantages in a production standpoint have kind of outweighed its advantages, and that's why you're not seeing them used anymore. I um, know two this, words that'll make Ben cry, Apex Seals. What? Yeah. This, this engine right here is the race-winning engine from the 787B that won Le Mans. You can see it's a four-rotor rotary engine real ported. I mean, that, that thing's just sweet. So let's get into this real quick. Um, so these, these engines sometimes are called Winkle engines because they were uh, conceived or, or, or brought about by Felix Winkel, which is a German engineer in the, in the um, late 1920s. He later worked for NSU in Germany and through the 50s ended up building the first prototype engine. Um, NSU then um, licensed that patent to a lot of other manufacturers. Uh, Mr. Wankel's engine, like you can see in the picture here, was, was even more complicated and unique than um, a lot of others because you can see that it's round on the outside and it actually spun on two... Uh, two deals and that the rotor spun, but the housing on the inside also spun. And so it was very balanced, but it made it even more complicated. His original engine here, you would have to rip the engine apart just to change the spark plug. And so they came up with other designs that are more well, like what we see in production where the housing itself is not spinning, just the rotor spinning on the inside. So 
Something right. confused so me about this. So lots of like, manufacturers. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that Mazda, it says Mazda is the only manufacturer to bring it to the masses. Yeah, I could swear that I've mm -hmm. seen tractors and planes with rotaries before. Oh, I'm, I'm sure you have. But when I say the masses, what I mean is um, building, you know, essentially millions of vehicles, millions of engines to, to people, uh, right? Okay. So lots of manufacturers from Mercedes-Benz to General Motors to lots of them messed around with rotary engines in the 1960s and then pretty much in the 1970s when emissions regulations really started to come into play, everybody pretty much dropped their rotary um, uh, programs. Uh, General Motors was going to build a real nice uh, rotary engine that was actually going to be licensed to AMC and go in the AMC Pacer and that was dropped and um, so you have seen lots of stuff. There's some really cool rotary goat cart engines and there's uh, rotary engines for planes and different things, but nothing in a really, really large scale production. So out, out of all the manufacturers, Mazda was the only one who really said, okay, we're going to build millions of cars. And so their, their first car, I want to say was the 1967 Cosmos. And then it went through, you know, the RX2, RX3, RX4, um, rx7 and then they brought it back with the rx8 they're always rumoring to bring it back again the latest addition of this engine would be to have an engine like this and it's spinning a generator so essentially it's an electric car but the rotary engine is what's spinning a generator to act as like a range extender to make the car go go further and by that you could keep the rotary engine running at like a very narrow rpm range um, and maybe get around some of its um, some of its uh, limitations. So, all right, let me clear out these drawings, and we will keep going. All right. So I grabbed a a clip here from CDX talking about rotary engines. Um, I got a nice little shot of the RX8 there, which was the last. Um, you know, for production rotary engine available in a street car. And, you know, I'm thinking this is another about, video you can't put on YouTube because of the CDX thing, though. Yes, exactly. So the, um, you know, the nice thing about it is you have such a smooth power delivery because you're not changing a reciprocating or up and down motion to a rotary motion, right? So even when a rotary engine is spinning at a pretty high amount of RPM, it really doesn't feel wound up. You don't have the same vibration. And so what Mazda did on their, on their cars is they would have a buzzer come on at, uh, I wanna say at 8,000, 8,000 RPM or maybe 7,500, uh, but they would have a little buzzer come on and go murr, murr, on the dash to let you know that, hey man, you got this thing wound up um, because it really, it doesn't feel wound up. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at the, cycle here and Forget, we're what's gonna the red line it's in like nine thousand well it de it depends um in fact let let me let me do this let me let me move some stuff around on my desktop so that we can get the document camera going because so i have some rotary parts here and I need to do a new share. What we're going to do is the screen. And with that, we're going to look at the document camera, I think. There we go. All right, so let's, let's do a lay of the land first uh, and do the, do the parts, right? So this would be a, a rotor housing. Um, and the rotor housings on the inside have a chrome finish on them to, you know, make them try to last longer. You notice you have two spark plugs on the side. And if I can get the camera working there, um, you have a leading. There's an L right there and a T right there for leading and trailing. Let's see if I can try it that way. 
So leading and trailing spark plugs, um, coolant went around on these passages on the outside of the housing. You can see how the spark plugs would have little holes there in the housings themselves. The presentation the side is of the house frozen, but your webcam is fine. What's that? The presentation seems frozen, but the webcam is fine. Okay, so you can see the webcam, right? Yeah, I can see the webcam and your cursor moving around on the presentation, but the uh, the presentation itself from the camera, it's like like one FPS, it's not wanting to do anything. So you can't see a lot of movement from the camera. Let no, see. but it's like it's like a stop and go motion picture kind of thing. Okay, hang on a sec. I'm probably running out of. Let me do this. Let me close that, and we'll close a few other um, things here. All right. Um, how about that? Is that any better? Like, are you, can you see my pen? I can. I can see your pen moving. Okay. All right. So you can see this rotor housing, and if we look in inside here, you can see that there's a port. There's a port through the side. I just stuck a pencil through there. Um, on the older rotary engines, the exhaust ports were side ports. Now, one of the thing I want to point out on this particular housing, why, why I have it in my junk bin, is if I look down here, you can see all that pitting. This one, this housing has had severe water damage. And one of the, um, one of the challenges with these engines was, was temperature. And so if I look around here, there's these grooves that O-rings would go in. If you overheated these engines, these seals would blow out. Water from here would get in the housing here and cause a lot of this pitting and the chrome and stuff would flake off of there. So there we have the rotor housing and that's aluminum. And so it's relatively lightweight. Um, get rid of my scribbles there. Um, there's a rotor itself and you can see all the all the pitting on there from the from the water that it ingested. You can see what's left of its apex seal is wiped out and its internal gear inside there that would match a gear in the end housing. Um, the rotors, we always think about the apex seals. Wiped out, I'd say non-existent. <laughs> yeah, we always think about the apex seals, but there's also these side seals that are really critical, right? So one of the major challenges with rotary engines was getting stuff to seal up. And so it required a complex uh, setup of apex seals and side seals. And these seals are so wiped out uh, it's pretty hard to tell, but if you look right here, there's, there's a little groove. It's actually two seals that cover each other or slide back and forth um, inside there. So, um, so there's the rotor. This is the eccentric shaft, which would take the place of your crankshaft. And uh, why I wanted to point this out, again, you can see the water damage on this one. Um, it's got a big jet here for oil because the rotor itself, the rotor is not cooled, right? We only cool the housing on the outside. So how do we cool this rotor? Well, we spray oil inside these channels here and use the oil to pull the heat out of the inside of the rotor. So uh, they put an additional load on the, on the lubrication system of the engine. Not only are we taking some of the oil to help lubricate the apex seals, but we're also using the oil to help cool the engine quite a bit. Okay, last, but certainly not, uh, 
certainly not least. And that is the end housing. Why are the end housings heavy? Because this is the part that's made out of cast iron. Um, so you have your internal gear, which is pressed in the housing. And this guy right here, this is your, this is your intake port. That side port, the air flows from the intake and goes in there. Now, what they were able to do, how they brought the rotary back in the early 2000s with the RX-8, is they made the exhaust port also a side port. So imagine the exhaust port on there, and then that allowed the rotor timing of the way the air goes in and out of the, in and out of the engine, that made that change so they could change the timing of that and make the engine run clean enough to pass emission standards. It does make the RX-8 engines run hotter because the exhaust gases don't just go straight out the rotor. They have to go out, make a turn, go through the housing, and then out. Um, How do the uh, RX-7s pass smog since they're so emissions heavy? Though? Well, the, the old ones um, that were carbureted, like mine, were dismal for trying to pass smog. Like, I used to fight and fight and fight those cars through smog. Um, and through that, I realized that, you know, there, there were several other 1970s, early 80s era cars that really were bad on smog. Um, like, let's say you had an old Toyota pickup truck. Um, you know, the, that old, those old Toyota pickup trucks that were carbureted were bad on smog. Any car that came from the manufacturer I, with like I know, uh... three catalytic converters and a thermal sensor, if the cat started to overheat, that would turn a warning light on. Basically, the manufacturer knew that it was bad on smog and they were relying on the cats and air injection to clean it up. So, um, yeah, I the know old ones were Chevy difficult. and GMC square bodies were terrible too, as well as the Ford Broncos. But as they went into the 80s and they became fuel injected, they because they had much better control of the fuel, they got much better at passing emissions as long as everything mechanically was okay with the motor. So if you were gonna get one and purchase it and, and make it a street drivable car that has to pass smog, I would recommend having one that's fuel injected, not one that's carbureted. Um, now, Nathan, why pull the parts up on the screen? As you would ask me about the RPM of the engine. And so at about 8,500 RPM, the stock internal gears that, that um, mesh with the gear inside the rotor, which allow it to go through this kind of unique shape as it goes through there. Well, you can have gear failures and other things at somewhere around eight to 9,000 RPM. So unless you've upgraded these internal gears and stuff, yeah, somewhere around 9,000 RPM, you really wouldn't want to rev it past that. And if it was an engine that you're going to be on a regular basis, um, revving it up high um, and really racing it, if you haven't upgraded these, probably around 8,000 RPM is where you would really want to, you know, be shifting before. Our car, to make sure it lasts a long time, our shift light's set for 7,200 and usually around 7,500 RPM. You know, a, a moment after you see the light, we'll we'll sh we'll shift it just to make sure the engine lasts a long time. At, at least it's not like fails. a semi where you shift in like fifteen. No, <laughs> when one of these uh, gears fails, it does damage a lot of stuff. Now, if you build it up with you know good internal components, you have strong uh, gears on there, then yeah, ten, twelve, fifteen thousand, you know. RPM can be can be possible and it's and it's real smooth in its in its delivery. So now you've seen some of the ports. Remember that's the intake port. Um, it's where this is where a lot of people remove material from to make it to make it flow more and make more power. Okay. So with that, I am going to close the camera. And we will open back up the presentation.
one question if you could like switch into transmission land for a second how would a transmission work on a rotary the transmissions work the same as as any car like the same same way it yeah like this goes straight to the eccentric shaft instead of like a crankshaft kind of thing yeah the the eccentric shaft essentially is your is your crankshaft um okay I wanted to punch that video. And another one up. was more about pers uh, your personal driving. Would would you consider it faster to double clutch or float gears? I I wouldn't double clutch if I didn't have the double clutch right because um transmission you shouldn't have to uh double clutch it usually when we had the double clutch stuff is where we had transmissions that weren't fully synchronized all right back to the rotary engines so if i looked at one rotor and a typical rotary engine that we would find in any rotary engine uh for the united states we had um we had you know two rotors in there well you have three sides and you got to think of each side of this is almost like its own piston and its own cylinder. So while this side over here is going on its um, compression stroke, uh, this guy over here is going on power and it's going to lead up to exhaust stroke. This one over here is starting intake stroke. So one rotor is, is somewhat of the equivalent of three cylinders. All right. Um, so with that, this thing going. All right. So showing how it sweeps around in its in its housing. Another couple shots of an RX-8, which again makes me want to get an RX-8. Um, and then this is their latest engine. Remember this? The RX-8 had the Renesis. Uh, rotary engine, which is the one that had side ports for both the intake and the exhaust. Um, of course, from the factory, they put a bunch of plastic covers on it. But. All right, so we're going to follow this one side, this one rotor face around, right? He's uncovering the intake port. So essentially, he's like doing his intake stroke right now. So he uncovers that port, brings in the air fuel mixture. Now, here's what's important to understand is that although I'm pumping oil, I'll change my color here to brown, here, let's say for oil, although I'm pumping oil around on the inside and spraying inside the housings and stuff, because there's air fuel mixture over here, the only way for me to really lubricate the apex seals and the side seals is to bring in some oil with the air fuel mixture, much like a two stroke engine has oil in with the air fuel to lubricate these apex seals and the side seals. So even when a rotary engine is running perfectly, a rotary engine is consuming oil out of the crankcase and injecting it into the air fuel mixture entering the engine to lubricate the apex seals. So that means a rotary engine is always burning some oil, okay? Now, what a lot of racers will do is they'll get rid of that oil injection system and they'll just put two-stroke oil directly in the gas tank. Um, if you run somewhere about one ounce of oil per gallon is all you need to uh, lubricate those apex seals. And if you have a street car, what you'll find is it will last a lot, lot longer engine mechanically speaking, the apex seals will last a lot longer if you do run a little bit of oil in your fuel to give it that little bit of extra lubrication. You can also see that running oil in with the air fuel mixture is going to lead to increased exhaust emissions. It's going to poison the catalytic converter faster. And so from the factory, they would run the least amount of oil they possibly could get away with and kind of sacrifice apex seal longevity to make sure the cat converter would not fail 
in warranty and make sure that the engine met its emission warranty requirements and all that other stuff. So, um, would it be you're possible not concerned to run about emissions? The... Add some lubrication to it. But yeah, normally speaking, they would take oil from the engine and inject it into the incoming airstream from the factory. All right. Would it be possible to run the normal oil injection system and put two-stroke oil in the gas tank? Yes, it is. That's exactly what I do is I just dump a little extra two-stroke in the gas tank and I still have the oil injection system on there. And why do I do that? Because every once in a while I'll do something stupid. I'll put some gas in the car and I'll forget to add the oil, right? Or because my car has spent a lot of time at school, I'll have a student and they'll help me and they'll say, hey, Mr. French, I put some gas in your car. Well, maybe they didn't grab the can of gas that had the two stroke oil in there. So I want that little bit extra protection to make sure that if I forget to mix the oil in with my fuel, I won't just roast my engine, right? So, so I have left my oil injection system in place and I still add a little bit of two stroke oil with the fuel which is what a lot of people do. People who have all out race motors that are gonna label their gas and be really dil diligent, they might remove that whole oil injection system, but I've chosen not to do that because too many times I've been at a hurry at the racetrack and I meant to mix my gas and I forgot. And so it just gives you a little bit extra uh, margin for error, so. All right, so we're doing our intake stroke then we've come around and we're, you can see that it was getting close to the spark plugs, right? And it's doing compression right now. Now that this side here is right up at the spark plugs, we've compressed the air fuel mixture into as tight a space as possible. Um, and the spark plugs are going to fire as the spark plugs fire, it pushes the rotor around, it follows the shape of the housing because of the centric shaft and the way the gears mesh. And now it's going on its power stroke, right? And burning the air fuel mixture and throwing that rotor housing to the side. As soon as I begin to uncover this exhaust port here, that's where the gases are going to flow out. So if I Clear my drawings. So I uncover the exhaust port, exhaust gases start to flow out. The rotor is face is going to come along the bend here and expel out the remaining gases. So let me get this point right. Right here. Um, so uh, that's the rotary engine cycle. It still goes through an intake event, a compression event. It has an ignition event, right? Where the spark plugs fire, power and exhaust, right? It does the four strokes of the four stroke cycle. You still have to do intake, compression, power, exhaust, but it does those uh, all by uncovering and, and covering up ports in the, in the side housings and, and in the rotor housings. Um, so there's no camshafts, there's no valves, there's no valve springs. So there's a lot less parts and pieces to make it happen. And of course we followed one rotor housing around, right? We followed one rotor housing around right here. But while that guy was doing his thing, we were looking at that, this guy was doing his thing and this guy was doing his thing. So that's why I said each face of the rotor essentially is is somewhat comparable to a, a piston uh, and cylinder. And so uh, that's why this one rotor would be, you know, kind of like a three cylinder engine in a way. It does not run as efficiently. So it's not a pure, you know, one to one, but it, it, does, um, it does somewhat correlate. So even though like a 12A rotary engine is rated at 1.2, uh, liters of displacement um, in racing a, a lot of times they'll make that thing equivalent to like a two and a half liter engine as far as power delivery wise. Um, so the big downside of the rotary engine really comes down to two things fuel economy and emissions and for that I'm going to keep this this picture up in that why why fuel economy well 
we can see that, you know, the, um, we, we were injecting oil in with the fuel, but ultimately this is a big long surface. And this big long surface has a huge quench area, meaning that the fuel is likely to turn back into a liquid and not get burned. So because that surface is so, you know, unique in its shape, you get lots of fuel being caught up by the apex seals and the corners. And then when it goes on exhaust stroke, a lot of raw fuel just goes right out the exhaust. Additionally, is that why I see a lot of RX-7s shooting flames out the tailpipe? Because they're yeah, throwing yeah, fuel and they, off the they exhaust? Yeah, they have kind of a slow combustion, like, like because this combustion surface is so large, the combustion process takes longer to happen because it's got to cover more ground. At the same time, this thing's spinning around in here a lot really fast, right? So the combustion takes a long time, but it really doesn't have that much time to combust. If I clear my drawings here and I rewind this thing, like here it's going on combustion, it's starting to uncover the exhaust port. So oftentimes the fuel is still burning as it's being forced out of the housing. So ultimately what you get is a rotary engine is, um, you know, it's two Achilles heels are fuel economy and emissions, right? That's just, you know, it's, it's a great engine for a lot of power output for its size. Um, so from, from a racing engine standpoint, it's a great engine. Um, and that's why it had a lot of racing success in its, in its day, even though only one car manufacturer really used it, right? You had Mazda was the only one that really raced with it substantially and they had a lot of success, right? Think of if, you know, Chevy and Ford and, you know, other manufacturers were using, they would have been winning all kinds of stuff. So from a race standpoint, it works, it works well. Um, but from a production standpoint where you're trying to meet fuel economy standards and emission standards, it's a real challenge and it all comes down ultimately um, to the shape, the shape of this rotor. It's just, it's just too big of a, of a surface area, right? That little cut out there forms the, essentially the combustion chamber and that means all this other surface is quench area where fuel can go and hide, turn back into a liquid and not get burned. Um, so those are, those are the challenges. Now, um, under racing conditions, it's, it's, really, it's really reliable and durable. You know, like you don't have to bore out cylinders and replace camshafts and you're not going to miss a shift and, and suck a bunch of valve springs and have, uh, you know, valves and pistons contacting each other. You know, every couple of seasons, maybe you have to rebuild it and replace the apex seals. But from a race engine standpoint, yeah, like it's, it's a really reliable engine. Um, does it get good fuel economy? No. Although what you'll find is any engine, if you're always operating it at wide open throttle, doesn't get good fuel economy, right? So under those conditions, why, why you know, it did well at Le Mans and stuff is at wide open throttle, all engines are, you know, drink of fuel pretty heavily. So in a wide open condition, it's not that bad compared to piston engines, but in part throttle applications, like you're driving, like you would be driving around town, fuel economy is poor, emissions are high, and that's ultimately what, um, what uh, kills it. So this is the link to that video that we watched earlier. Um, and these were their you know, winning, winning rotary cars that Mazda had. The one there in the center, the 787, is the one that, that won Le Mans. Um, okay, so advantages, so great I wonder power what to thing. weight ratio. I yeah. wonder if a rotary would have enough power and torque to work in a semi. Well, they, they don't make a lot of torque. They make more high RPM power, right? If you think about it, it's not like that eccentric shaft has a lot of stroke to it. 
so they don't tend to make a lot of torque. Um, they're more better for a high RPM power. Okay. They do have so it a wide do all that torque well curve, in my truck. Um, but it's not a lot of torque, but it's, it's, it's consistent across the power band. Yeah, so for that application, it, ne it wouldn't necessarily work well unless you had the, the transmission gearing so the engine's buzzing at like 7,000 and then it's, you know, geared down. Um, anyways, uh, really, it, it comes down to it's a great, it, it, it's a great engine for the purpose of racing and not necessarily other things, right? Um, it's great power for the size, no vibration, not prone to engine knock. Um, and so like you can run them on lower octane fuels and that's why they're so popularly um, uh, turbocharged and stuff. They make a lot of exhaust heat because as we said, the exhaust is still burning as it's flying out of the exhaust port. So again, it works well with the turbo because that heat creates turbo pressure, which helps the turbo spool up. Um, so, you know, the, the advantages weight and power but disadvantages right right rotor ceiling ceiling apex seals coming apart the slow combustion we talked about um, ultimately leading to bad fuel economy and high exhaust emissions right and you know um, people would tend to run them and run them and run them once the the chrome housings are done um, you're pretty much hosed, right? Like if you took took it apart on a periodic basis, replaced the apex seals, didn't allow the engine to overheat, didn't allow the housings to get warped um, or the chrome to get pitted, they, they last a long, long time. Usually what happens is that you start getting an engine that's smoking because you worn the housings and the side seals and now oil's getting in the combustion chambers that type of thing or um, a lot of these got overheated um, you know the downside of adding the turbocharger to it is it just increased the heat load on the engine so having a good cooling system is important so um, the fuel economy and emissions are what killed it for production standpoints now, what types of modifications do you commonly see? Well, because there's no cams or valves that, you know, if you think of any engine modifications, we're usually trying to improve airflow, right? Well, this is, this is the same, but we don't have to worry about cams and valve springs and stuff. We're gonna work on a good flowing intake and exhaust system. So intake and exhaust improvements to improve the flow are a big deal, right? I also mentioned turbocharging but what you also tend to see a lot of is porting, right? Because if I can change the shape and size of these ports, here's one on an RX-8 with the side ports on the exhaust, um, that will change the time that the air fuel enters and exits the, um, the combustion chamber essentially and it changes the power characteristics of the engine quite a bit. So this guy going on here importing, that's like the equivalent of changing a, a camshaft and putting that high lift, high duration cam in there. So I have street porting, bridge porting, and peripheral porting. A street port would be like this, where we've just kind of increased the, that port and made it flow a little nicer, that type of thing. When I go to bridge porting, well, now I have a whole extra intake port on there and a little extra window there, and you can see where I can bring in a lot more air fuel mixture now, okay? Peripheral porting is where you can see where the, the exhaust goes straight through the rotor housing. Well, now the intake port is going straight into the housing as well, okay? So that's where you're gonna have an engine that makes the most amount of power, um, but it's also gonna have the most narrow power window. So it's gonna be an engine that maybe makes power from 7,000 RPM to 9,000 RPM, really high in the spectrum, but it might be making, you know, 300 horsepower from a two rotor, naturally aspirated rotary engine. So um, as you start increasing the size of the ports, right? Imagine that you have the rotor housing is having to, if I draw a rotor in here, and here's the apex seal, it's having to jump the gap of those big ports in there, right? So it does put more wear and tear on the 
apex seals and even the side seals, right? The side seals are wiping across the surface. So the bigger you make the ports, the bigger of a gap the seals have to jump as the seals then wear, they wear a little faster. And then as they wear, they can get caught in a port and cause catastrophic damage, right? So again, as you make the ports larger and larger, you start, you make more power, but you start to take away some of the engine's longevity. Um, so it's all, it's all relative, right? All right, so um, what you'll find as you um, port the engine is it, doesn't usually make a whole lot more torque, but it does tend to make more power. It goes up in the RPM spectrum there. All right, fun, definitely fun, fun stuff though. Um, so my wrap up on this presentation is uh, if you're gonna go forced induction, right? Power adders where it'll be turbocharging or supercharging or even running nitrous, Proper planning is required, right? Everything from the heat range of the spark plugs to your compression ratios. And if you don't do that stuff, you're gonna run into problems, right? On rotary engines, they're awesome for racing, not necessarily awesome for, you know, as a commuter car driving back and forth to work um, because they get, you know, poor fuel economy and stuff. But they, they just have such a neat power delivery, such a neat sound. That, that's why you see so many people still very enthusiastic about them. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that one off. Um, so we have one last short presentation to, um, to finish up here. And I'm gonna get that going and we will share that screen. I remembered which so, Audi vehicle it was. It was the SQ7. Hmm. That's interesting. Which, apart from being you know, twin charged, yeah, it's electric also supercharged. a diesel. Hmm. So um, this is gonna. I'm gonna go through this one pretty quickly, um, and uh, I talk about it more like when I'm doing like the engine engine building class, engine repair and stuff. Um, but um, anyways. Uh, I, this little image here, I kind of like it. This is that Chrysler uh, 2.5 engine that you would have had in like a LeBaron or, or something. Um, this one is turbocharged. They, and so you can see it's got an oil line go, going back here to the turbocharger to cool that turbocharger. It's got a balance shaft here in the bottom, oil pickup. All right. So remember that your lubrication system provides pressurized oil it provides pressurized oil to your main bearings and, and a lot of the parts of the engine that are pretty darn important, they just get splash lubrication. So like your pistons and cylinder walls, splash lubrication, the actual lobes of the camshaft, splash lubrication. Not only does the, the oil lubricate the parts, right? And it does that by basically keeping metal to metal parts from touching, right? That's how the lubrication works. Um, it also removes a lot of heat from the engine uh, as well. So somewhere on the range of 20% of your engine's cooling system actually that 20% of that heat is removed from the engine from the lubrication system. As you splash the oil on hot parts, the oil flows away and it pulls some of the heat with it. Obviously, if it's a rotary engine or an air-cooled engine like a Volkswagen or a Porsche um, uh, or a Corvair or something, it's, it's going to, uh, that lubrication system is going to do a higher percentage of engine cooling on those other engines. All right. Um, your oil pump traditionally was driven by your distributor, which was driven by your camshaft on an, old, on an older engine. More modern engines though, uh, this oil pump will likely be driven off of the crankshaft. There's different types of oil pumps from rotor pumps to uh, gear-driven pumps. Oil that an engine needs. 
like this pump right here. Um, and uh, if we look at these, these different pumps, one thing is really, really important. Um, and that is uh, the oil pump. Um, it's the first guy to see that oil, right? So I have here that the oil pump is the garbage pit of the engine. It's sucking oil off the bottom of the pan. If it's all nasty in the bottom of the pan, it's going to clog up this little filter screen and you're gonna, you're gonna tear up your pump, okay? If you have an older engine where the oil pump is driven off the distributor and you're having distributor shaft problems and stuff, check your oil pump, okay? A lot of your modern engines to make them more and more efficient, they actually have variable displacement oil pumps in them. So everything's getting more and more complicated. If you're rebuilding an engine, you might be smart just to replace the oil pump. If it's an integral pump, then you really wanna check it out. And there's all kinds of um, inspections and checks where you're measuring uh, wear on the different parts of the oil pump. Here's a couple shots of a, of a badly worn oil pump that was causing the distributor drive to actually bend and twist inside of the engine. Um, speaking of lubrication systems, there's some technology in your oil filter themselves. Uh, there's an anti-drain back valve, so that's why it's so hard to get the oil out of your filter, because there's a valve in there trying to keep the oil in the filter. That keeps the engine like primed up, ready to go, so you have uh, you know, oil pressure quicker on a, on a startup. There's also the filtering media, and in the bottom of this filter, there's a little pressure relief valve that we'll, we'll look at here in a minute. Obviously, a better oil filter, a better oil filter is going to have more pleats of filtering material inside here, so it's going to have more filtering surface, right? And if I rebuilt an engine, one of the things that I like to do after that rebuild is, is after I break it in, is cut apart that filter and do an inspection on it. And if I have an engine that I'm racing, if I suspect any Thing going on with the engine, I will then again take the oil filter apart, use a filter cutter to uh, open it up and look inside the filter media to see if there's any problems with it. Okay, so get this thing playing. So I just recorded uh, an animation here off of uh, CDX showing the showing the whole lubrication system. It's, it's really pretty cool. Remember that you have pressurized lubrication from your oil pump where it picks the oil up off the pan, sends it through the pump. This pump's driven off the crankshaft, sends it to the main oil gallery. It goes from the crank to the rods and then to the bearings. Um, now, before it gets to those main oil pressure galleries, uh, it's got to go through the oil filter, right? So here we have the oil pump sucking up the oil. It runs through the oil filter and then uh, goes to the main oil galleries. However, as the engine speed increases, uh, this thing's pumping more oil than the engine really needs. So this little pressure regulator here opens up and uh, lets oil go back to the pan. Here we're looking at an oil filter and you can see the, the, the oil goes from the outside of the filter through the media and then to the inside of the filter, that's how it filters. So that junk will be caught on the outside of the filter. Now, if the oil filter becomes blocked, there's a little valve here in the bottom of the filter that's gonna open up to let the oil bypass the filter media. So if you run your, your engine a long time, you never change the oil, you never change the filter. At some point, this little bypass valve is gonna open up and it will allow dirty oil to flow through the engine. But the thought process there is, hey, dirty oil is better than, it's better than no oil at all. So that's what they do. All right. Um, so what oil to use? Well, if you were breaking in a fresh engine build, that's a little different than day to day, right? So traditionally on a fresh engine build for break in, they would, uh, it is recommended by bearing manufacturers to run more of a non-detergent oil because there has been some issues with different oil detergents maybe taking away that top bearing coat. Um, although I, I haven't personally seen that be the case, they'll usually say, hey, run a standard weight oil that's non-detergent for break-in. Um, you also want to run an oil that has more zinc in it. Now there's an additive called ZDDP, 
which is essentially zinc. It's a high pressure additive. If you have a flat tappet camshaft, meaning that the, the, the lifters are not roller, having the extra zinc in the oil is gonna help save that camshaft. And so the best thing to do probably for breaking in a new engine would be to run a product like this, a break-in oil. It's an oil that's going to not have as many detergents in it, but it's going to have a good viscosity index that you need. It's gonna have the higher levels of ZDDP, and that's gonna help the piston rings break into the cylinder walls a little faster and give you the camshaft protection that you want. Um, so, one thing you'll notice about these break-in oils is they are typically not a synthetic oil because I don't want the oil so slippery that the piston rings can't wear me into the cylinder walls, right? Remember that when you're building an engine, we're gonna put honing scratches. My honing scratches are not looking that good right now, but we're gonna put honing scratches in the cylinder walls so that when the uh, piston, that's a bad looking piston too, and it's piston rings wear on the cylinder walls, it helps break in the piston rings to the cylinder walls. Well, if I have something that's, that has too much lubricity to it, it won't allow proper piston ring break in. And that's gonna, um, you know, hurt the, hurt the engine's um, ability to seal the pistons to the cylinder walls. It's gonna cause more oil consumption. So a break-in oil is typically not a synthetic oil. Once you've done your 500 mile break-in or so and the piston rings are now wear made into the cylinder walls, your cylinder ceiling is, is up where you want it to be, then you could switch it over to a synthetic oil. So what's the deal with synthetic oil? It is man-made, meaning that it's going to give you a more uniform base stock. All the molecules here are the same size, right? Because we're not taking crude oil out of the ground and refining it, basically cooking it to try to get stuff to be the right size. We're making stuff the right size. A lot of these are made for, from esters or uh, casters oils, but they're made from various oil alcohol derivatives and you get a uniform molecular structure. Uh, conventional oil that's refined you're likely to have some of the molecules be real big, right? Heavy ones inside there. And you're likely to get some that are real small as well. And then as you use the oil, the light ones will burn away. The heavy ones will stay. You're not gonna have the quite the same um, uh, cold temperature capabilities or hot temperature capabilities. And what's gonna happen- Synthetic oil also smells way worse than normal oil. <laughs> Do you think it smells worse? I don't. Um, yeah. Well, synth synthetic oil is not because the base stock is better. It's going to require less uh, work from the additive package because it's not just oil. It's not just the oil molecules. It's all the additives and things we put in the oil, like. Um, viscosity index improvers, detergents, all these different additives that we put in the oil to get it to do its job. And we don't have to rely on those additives as much when we have a better base stock. So synthetic oil is good stuff. Can you switch back and forth between synthetic and regular? You can. Um, you don't necessarily want to be mixing up your own blends of oil though, right? You're not a chemist. Um, so try to drain out all the old oil and, and then fill it with new oil and change the filter if you're gonna switch from synthetic to regular. Um, what you find is synthetic oil is gonna give you, I have here, better thermal stability. What do we mean? Well, that means at lower temperatures, it's gonna be more fluid and at higher temperatures, it's gonna be more stable. And so if you're gonna be pushing an engine to its limits, whether you're operating it in really cold conditions are really hot conditions, um, whether it's heat from combustion, like you put a big turbo or something on there, or it's heat just ambient conditions or both, the synthetic oil, it's better base stock, it's gonna be more stable under those conditions. Okay. Um, 
before I get into blends, I will say that even though the synthetic oil is more stable, it still will get dirty, right? What, what turns your oil from a nice caramel color to a black is the, the carbon that gets past the piston rings in the combustion process and goes down into the oil. So I would not say that it's better to run dirty synthetic oil than conventional oil because that dirt gets in there and gets embedded in the bearings and causes all kinds of problems. So you can't just necessarily put synthetic in and never change it because you will still get combustion blow bypass the piston rings and your oil will still get dirty. So at some point you got to change it out of there. And it's kind of a compromise into how often do I change it my recommendation is you change the oil as often as it gets dirty. Um, so what about the blends? Well, here's what I don't currently like about the blends. The idea with the blend is that, um, you know, you get some of the benefits of synthetic oil, but not all the costs of synthetic oil, right? But there's no standardization of what the blend is. So you can buy a bottle of synthetic oil that says, hey, it's a synthetic blend, and maybe it's 95% conventional oil and only 5% synthetic. Or you could get one that was 50-50. There's no standardization on that right now. And so because of that, I tend to stay away from the blends. Either spend the money for the synthetic. Do, do some manufacturers or list down. what the percentages uh, are? Uh, I, some, I don't know. I, maybe on their MSDS sheets or something. Um, I want to say I've seen it from somebody, but I don't remember what it, if it was now because Amsoil is 100% synthetic. I have seen it listed by one manufacturer, but I can't remember which one it was. So what I will say is commonly they do not. Okay. Um, now I talked about multi viscosity viscosity index improvers just a minute ago. And, and how those work, how, how do I get an oil? This one says 5W20 here. How do I get it to act as a five weight oil under cold conditions and act as a 20 weight oil under hot conditions or 212 degrees is when it acts as a 20 weight oil. How do we do that? Well, we put these viscosity index improvers in here and what they, what they do, that additive, um, basically when it's cold, it's molecular structure kind of straightens out. But when it gets hot, its molecular structure kind of balls up. And so as it gets hotter, it increases the viscosity or it increases resistance to flow because it gets all kind of bound up in there. And so I learned that a long time ago and I thought, oh, that sounds pretty, pretty great. I didn't understand what it really was though until just last year when I got to go to a, to a training session on oils and they said, hey, here's some viscosity index improver additive right here. And so what exactly is this stuff? Well, if I can get my little video here to play. So that looks like a powder stuff, right? Basically all that is, that viscosity index improver, it's rubber, like rubber from the bottoms of your sneakers. They take the rubber, they grind it up really, really, really fine, throw it in the oil. Okay, so they got a big chunk of it there. That, that amount would probably, you know, fill several, several cases of oil. But essentially when the rubber gets hot, it kind of like flares out and gums things up. And when it cools down, it kind of flattens out and flows better. And so what you'll find is in a conventional oil to get it to truly be multi-viscosity, they have to add more rubber to it or more viscosity index improver to it to get it to work properly than you would have to do with the synthetic oil, right? Over time, the oil doesn't sit necessarily wear out right away, but the viscosity index improvers and other additives start to get all chewed up as they go through the engine. And so you start to lose the viscosity of your oil. And it wasn't until I got to get my hand here on some of this stuff that I realized why. Like for instance, 
uh, an engine builder that I worked with, uh, yeah, who who built engines for Honda. He, they, they would ship their engine in from Japan. He would build it, Dino Tiger Integra and the Honda Odyssey van. And he said he always received his best horsepower ratings with used engine oil. Well, why is that? Because the used oil, the index improvers were all chewed up. It was basically thinning out the oil. So, all right. Um, so what I would recommend is choose the right oil for the job that you're trying to do. So to do that, you have to know, well, what's the, what's the job I'm trying to do here? Am I breaking in a fresh engine? Well, then I would want to use a break-in oil. Am I uh, just driving this vehicle normally, right? Well, then a nice oil like this is going to work just, just fine for what I'm doing. Am I doing some uh, track days or something? Well, maybe having a full synthetic oil that's going to handle those extra loads and temperatures is a better way to go. Or maybe I'm doing some racing. Um, or I'm doing basically all racing, and that would be the better product for me. So um, I'll play just a, just a minute of this um, video clip here. I get a new share going here. When you're talking about Japanese manufacturers, I was wondering something. Do they still have to check their vehicles and stuff for radiation before they export them? Uh, not anymore, but uh, Sean Powers, the guy I was talking about, he was working for Honda during that, that time with the uh, Fukushima nuclear plant failing. And he said it was a really tough time for them. And he ended up actually leaving Honda at the end of that. He got too burned out because all the testing labs in Japan were shut down. He was working like, you know, 80 hours a week. And it was just, it was a bad deal and it burned him out. So um, now they got that thing contained and that's not an issue that it once was. All right. Hi, I'm Cameron Evans from Redline Synthetic Oil, coming to you today from Camarillo, California at Timeless Customs. Today, we're going to talk about the difference between passenger car motor oils, the stuff you would run on the street, and Redline's racing oils, the stuff that you would run strictly on the track. The first of those differences is detergency and the dispersant, the things that trap contamination in your motor oil as you drive around on the street for 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, if you're a Redline person, 15,000 miles. Very different from what you would see in a racing oil where you don't have those levels of detergency. Why? Well, after all, on the street, you're going to leave this oil in for a long time. In a race car or in a serious track car, you may be only going to go two or three weekends before you go to change the oil. The other big difference between the street oils and the race oils from Redline is the levels of ZDDP. Now that's the anti-wear additive that you would know is zinc and phosphorus that protect hard, hot metal inside the engine when it's revved up. Cams, bearings, things like that. In the streetcar oils, we've got about 1,200 parts per million. That compares to API certified oils that are at a much lower level than Redline, 800 parts per million. Think about that. What you get typically at the auto parts store and what you order from Redline, you're getting almost 30% more protection just there. Now the race oils, they've got 2,200 parts per million in that ZDDP package. That's way more than you'd ever need or want to run on the street. Now, what's the risk of that? Think about it. On the street, you've got emissions equipment, a catalytic converter. If you ever had any kind of you know, breach of green seal or if the engine was to wear itself out, you could get oil passing rings. That oil might contaminate the can of catalytic converter. That happened with 22 chance you could clog the cap. So what are the situations that you might choose one of our street oils versus a race oil? Well, the obvious one is if it's your daily driver, that's gonna be a street car oil all day long. But what if you're a guy that takes your car to track days? You can still run Redline's PCMO oil. Again, 1200 parts per million of zinc, so there's more than enough protection. 
both the race oil and the street oil are made from PAO and ester, right? So you've got the highest quality raw materials to protect you not only on your daily drive, but also when you go to the track. Any of you racers that are only taking a car to the racetrack, well, you're more than eligible to be using our race oil. And that's in drag racing, road racing, circle track, even four cycle go-karts. We get questions often about how often should I change my motor oil? We're talking about for the street and for the track. So let's take your street considerations. So if you're the type of person who warms up your car in the morning, gets a cup of coffee, goes outside and commutes, let's say 40 or 50 miles to work, well, you're gonna be eligible for a pretty long drainage road. If you're the type that starts the car, pulls it in gear and only drives five minutes across town, chances are your motor oil never got up to temperature and those dispersants and detergents really couldn't get activated. When it comes to the track, totally different story. We're not very opinionated on when people change out their oil at the racetrack. And that's not so much because we want to sell them more motor oil. It's more a matter of people are pretty opinionated about it. Let's touch on oil temperature and what you might experience at the track compared to what you would see on the street. Remember, motor oil, 212 degrees, that is where a 30 weight is a 30 weight. That's when it's that level of thickness. Take a drag racer, for example. He's going to go to the water box, do a burnout, and go to stage. He may only get to a hundred degrees of oil temperature. So he may select these straight weight products or things that operate a lot more like straight weights in two weight, five weight, 10 weight, very thin motor oils. So when you look at the front of the label on Red Lines Racing Oils, you may see 30 weight race, 40 weight race. Remember, that does not mean that these oil are straight weights. Now, a lot of times you'll see other motor oil brands are coming up with 030s, 040s. They're dropping that oil weight. Well, there's sometimes a little bit of benefit from having that at cold start. One thing we like about Red Lines Race Oils being more of a 1540 is getting up to temperature fast. Remember, the whole goal of the motor oil is to get it, all the raw materials up to working temperature so that they can do the job you're calling on them for. So let's collect a little bit of what we've learned today. The street oils and the race oils, they're made from similar raw materials, but really just at different levels. And they're very particular about when you should run them. All right. Okay, let me get this back to this. All right, guys. All right, so you can see my PowerPoint again, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. Thank you, guys. Um, so it's pretty good uh, information there. So a couple things to take away, right? He talked about the zinc, like we were talking about, and how, how that gives you that extra protection. Why are they taking the zinc out of the oils? Uh, basically to protect your catalytic converters. And your modern engines are designed with roller uh, lifters and low friction valve trains so they can handle that. But if you have an old muscle car engine that's a flat tap at cam, you're really gonna want an oil that has that extra zinc content in it all the time, right? So that's something to think about is what type of engine do I have and then what am I doing with it? Maybe I want that extra protection. What do I, what's more important to me, protecting the engine or protecting the catalytic converter, right? So what that means is running a race oil like this one right here on a new car might void your uh, warranty for your uh, emissions equipment, right? So you really have to pay attention to what products you're running. And like I said, know what your, what your job is. What, what are you asking the oil to do? How are you driving this car? Are you breaking it in, in a new engine? Then you probably wanna break in oil. Am I doing normal driving or am I doing the occasional autocross, track day, drag race, or am I doing full out racing? Notice that the full out racing didn't have the same amount of detergents in it. It doesn't have those detergents because you're not typically going to have it in there as long, right? Also, he talked about how all these oils, they really need to get hot to get the additives working properly. So if you're doing a lot of short trip driving, that's why they recommend with short trips, you change your oil more often because you're not burning all the impurities out of the oil and you're not getting its detergent package and it's, it's dispersants and it's other additives working, right? So somewhere around, you know, 180, he mentioned how they test the oil at 212. I'll say 180 to 220 degrees, you know, is 
good normal oil temperature, you start getting over 220 and now that oil is getting pretty darn hot um, inside the engine. But if you don't get the oil temperature up to 180, it's hard for those additives to start working and doing their jobs. All right, so choose the right oil for what you're, what you're looking to do, right? Now pulling this conversation back to um, building an engine and starting up that engine for the first time, hopefully you guys that were in the engine class. Take the engine off the stand and place it on dolly wheels or install engine mounts. And I'm gonna turn the CDX guy off. Um, hopefully you guys that were in the engine class pre-lubed your engine before you fired up a fresh build. And I will say that if you have a car sitting around a long time, you've had something sitting around on the side of your house, it would be a good idea to pre-lube that engine before you start it up. So here, uh, this guy just pulled the engine off of the engine stand. He uh, thankfully remembered to make sure the cam shaft plug was in the back of the motor so it didn't spray oil all over the place. You'll also notice that he's got all the oil gallery plugs inside there. He's making sure that that thing is, is just under flush. He's putting a little fresh oil on the oil filter. And again, he's going to make sure that all the oil gallery plugs and stuff are, are closed up. Um, like I said on break-in, a good quality uh, oil filter is something good to have on there. And so here we have a, a small block Chevrolet. And what we're going to do is spin up the distributor to create oil pressure in the engine. Uh, once we hammer in that rear main seal, apparently. Um, but we're going we're gonna to spin up the, the distributor and create, create oil pressure so that our uh, engine bearings will have lubrication on startup. So there's an oil pump drive tool to do that. Um, some engines you can get away without one, but like that small block Chevy engine, it needs this silver part in the center to make sure that oil goes to the right passages in the, in the engine. Or you could use an old distributor and take the pieces out and that would work as well. So you can see he's spinning it up. He's got made sure he's got good oil pressure at 50 pounds, putting a mechanical oil pressure gauge on there would be important to, to do that, to monitor what the oil pressure is. And as a mechanic, I actually had my own like mechanical oil pressure gauges that I used to tap on the engines with so I could monitor what the oil pressure really was. Now here's another tip I really like. Again, if you're building that fresh engine, is spin up that oil pump and make sure you get oil up to the rocker arms, get oil all throughout the engine. And it usually takes a little while of spinning up that oil pump to get the whole thing lubricated where you're getting the oil all the way up to the valve train. You yeah, it took us nearly like 30 minutes when we were doing it. over the engine a couple of times by hand, right? Or with the ratchet there, like you saw, to make sure you get oil up to all the valve train components. If you do that, the engine's not gonna cold start without oil in it and you're not gonna be doing a bunch of wear. So that's why you would pre-lube the engine. Now what they've done here is they preset the timing to the spec. So hopefully they won't have to crank and crank the engine, but it'll fire up right away and build oil pressure. At this point, we can put our valve covers back on and get that engine to fire up. So we have a new engine build or maybe an engine that's just been sitting idle for a long time, sitting on the side of the house or something. We pre-lube the engine. If it was a fresh, a fresh uh, build, we put some break-in oil in it. And then when we go to fire it up, we're not going to let that thing idle down. We want the engine to run at a fast idle on break-in. Why? Well, the camshaft, the camshaft only has splash lubrication. So cam is all splash lube. Meaning that for the camshaft to have lubrication between the cam lobes and the lifters, we're counting on oil being thrown off the crankshaft to splash on the cam lobes. So we want enough engine RPM there that that oil is spinning off the, off the crankshaft and splashing on the camshaft to keep good lubrication on the cam. So we don't want to let the engine idle down. 
We want to keep it 1500, 2000 RPM for about the first 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes of its life. Okay. After that first 20 minutes, that's where we're breaking in the camshaft. After that, we can then let the engine idle down. Now, for the first 500 miles, we want to avoid high RPM. Okay. There's two things we're really breaking in here. That first 20 minutes, we're breaking in the cam and lifters. The first 500 miles, it's the piston rings to the cylinder walls. And so why do I want to avoid high RPM? And I mean like, let's say my engine had a red line of let's say 5,500 RPM, I don't really want to be over 4,500 RPM, right? I want to keep my RPM levels low because at high RPM, what I tend to get is what we call ring flooding, where the rings can vibrate in the ring lands and kind of like glaze over, and then I don't have the piston rings properly wear mating into the cylinder walls, okay? So avoid real high RPM but high load is okay. So you can get on it. You can get to, you know, half throttle, three quarter throttle, even short bursts at wide open throttle. You can put the load on it. In fact, the additional load, if this is my combustion here, forcing down on my piston, what that additional load does is it helps push the piston rings out and force those into the cylinder walls. So the load will help the engine break in faster, but I wanna stay away from high RPM. So high load is okay. I wanna stay away from high RPM. After that first 500 miles or so, or once I feel like I've properly broken in my piston rings, I wanna change that oil out of there, check my filter, uh, make sure there's not excessive metal bits or anything in it. Um, but at that point- So basically granny shifted for the first motor, 500 miles. The piston rings have broken into the cylinder walls. Well, now I now I can switch over to a synthetic oil if that's what I want to do, um, and uh, you know motor on happily. So um, I have one less uh, one last video clip here that we'll play. When me and my uncle we broke in our 180 cc engine that we bored out. We actually before we put the oh. before we put the piston back in, we actually put grease on, on the inside of the cylinder wall. Ask that question again, please. So I said before me, and my uncle, we broke in our 180cc engine that we that we bored. Yeah. We put grease on the inside of the cylinder wall, and then we put the piston in, and then put it bottom dead center, and then put a little more grease. Uh huh. And um, then it was a little tight at first, but then after a while, it just started right up, and then we kept it at a high RPM. Okay. All right. Right on. Um, yeah, you, usually you would use um, assembly lube like on the bearings and camshaft lobes and stuff. ATF works well as well. But you would use engine oil on piston rings. A lot of guys like the ATF. They feel like it breaks in the pistons and rings faster. The one thing I will caution you about ATF is it works good if you're going to start the engine right away. If you're building the engine, you lubricate stuff with ATF and then it sits in your garage for 10 years, that ATF is gonna cause parts to corrode, right? Like if you got ATF on your bearings, just like how ATF will eat the paint off your car, it'll eat some of the material off the bearings. So ATF works well because it's thin oil and it does promote break-in, but um, it's not good if it's gonna be sitting around. So to use for that application, right? Because that's what it's engineered to do. All right, so now we're gonna spire up this engine. We're gonna break in this camshaft. And honestly, I'm a sucker for, I love these uh, 3D animations showing us how these parts work. So let me get this going. Have someone crank the engine for you, but keep your face out of the way just in case. If it's sputtered, loosen the hold down clamp and advance the distributor a little at a time until the engine will fire up. If it still won't start, check the fuel and electrical supplies. 
When everything is correct and the advance is set right, the engine should fire up. Once it does, if you have a new cam, you must follow this camshaft braking procedure. Run the engine for 20 minutes at 2,000 revs per minute. The rule is that the engine must be above 1,500 RPM. Don't let it idle, even for a few seconds. If you notice a leak or any other problem, shut the engine off and fix the problem. But once it starts running again, you have to keep the engine speed above 1,500 RPM. Every few minutes, change the running speed a little to anywhere in the range of 1,500 to 2,500 RPM. The variations will help to properly break in the lobes of the cam and to keep enough oil circulating inside the engine during the break-in. After five or 10 minutes, you should see a little steam coming out of the open radiator. Carefully top it off with some water now that the air pockets have been worked out of the system. Then close the radiator cap before the cooling system becomes too hot to touch. For the rest of the break-in period, Keep a close watch for leaks and for wires touching the exhaust and melting as everything gets hotter. After a good solid 20-minute workout, bring the motor back to a lower RPM. All right, breaking in an engine can be kind of scary because the fresh paint's going to be burning off the exhaust manifolds. And But like I said, and like you saw in the video, if um, if you have, especially if you have a flat tap it cam, do not let that sucker idle down. You need the RPM to move the oil around to keep plenty of splash lubrication hosing down that camshaft and um, promoting a proper a proper break-in. So um, I have first 20 minutes critical for your camshaft, 500 miles critical for your rings to seat in. And then after that, you can switch over to your synthetic or whatever your, your oil of choice is. Um, so um, with that, we have, you know, finished covering all the technical stuff we wanted to cover. And you guys have just done an absolute um, fantastic job of that. Um, what I want to do now is bring this back to our, um, back to our website for our, um, our Canvas page for our class, okay? Um, what do you need to do to finish this class out? right? Um, this is our last, you know, uh, Zoom session. It's our last class meeting. What I need you guys to do is take your tests. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my student view, which should put the pink ribbon around here. And that should make it, other than the pink, it, it shouldn't make it look similar to yours. So you can see it took some of my options away. If I go to quizzes, there are two quizzes I need you to take. The EFI tuning one, this really lines up with the stuff that we've talked about. I'm sorry, the general tuning knowledge. This is the one that lines up with the, the stuff that we've talked about in class, okay? It's, it's only 14 questions. Um, some questions are more points than others because some are short answers, some are um, multiple choice. And it really lines up with what we've been uh, doing, okay? So, if I get out of there and I go to the EFI tuning exam, this one's arguably more difficult, right? Because it's, it's really focused on fuel injection. This is the same test they have everybody take at, um, at EFI University, okay? But it's a great test to really test your knowledge of engines and fuel injections. This will be more of like a, a credit, no credit. I want you to do this just to experience it, what, what it's all about, okay? Um, try to get the best grade that you can uh, on it. Um, the EFI tuner book is available to you, it, but it, you will learn something. The reason I'm having you do this is you will learn stuff by taking this test, okay? Because it really is, is pretty darn technical. If you get a chance, uh, look up some of the stuff from EFI University. If you really wanna get into fuel injection tuning, uh, those guys do a good job with that. Um, so that's what this test is all about. Um, so I want you to do those two uh, tests on there. We have had um, a couple of- Charlie put uh, in the chat that he got his uh, packet yesterday. Good, good. I did get those packets. I did get those last packets mailed. 
it's killing me. It seems like the price of postage keeps going up and up. So now it's like eight bucks per, per packet to mail it. So, oh, by the way. Did you um, send one to me or am I going to have to get it from you when we get? No, I'm just going to give it to you when I bring you your motorcycle, which I'm going to try to do that next week. I didn't make it to the college at all. Okay. So I, didn't, I didn't get permission to enter campus. And quite frankly, I was so busy working on that fall schedule again that it you, just you got just, frank's voicemail from yesterday right i talked to frank yesterday so the, the oh, okay. problem getting okay. on campus is like you got to go through like a multi-point security deal like i have to get special permission to get on campus and i can't just let anybody on, right. on there it's like entering so I'll, be, I'll be going there next week and i'll i'll make sure i get my pickup truck and something so i can get your motorcycle out of there okay <laughs> And Actually, I'll, I'll Johnson, it's much path. easier to get onto a military base than you would think. Yeah, well, it, it, it's it's a pain getting on the campus, and and um, it's not just getting on, but getting access to the auto shop. We our ID cards basically let us into the doors, and so they have to turn on my key card so it knows that my employee number is okay to access that building. Um, so, anyways. Um, I'm working on it. I'll hand deliver you your, your particular packet, Nathan. Um, all right. So when does everything, um, when does everything uh, wrap up? Well, basically, uh, uh, May, uh, not, uh, May 18th and 19th. In fact, I should make these all the same. I don't know why I got a little bit of variance here. May 20th is our last day of class. And after that, um, by the following uh, week, I have to get grades submitted to district office. So I need you to get everything in by the, by the 20th um, so I can start putting this stuff together. Um, so uh, where did- uh, The picking oh, a turbo assignment was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, I saw that you did that. That was pretty cool, right? And remember that's extra credit, so that's, that's that's cool. I haven't um, checked if you've graded it or not. <laughs> no, but I didn't. I, it, I didn't sure. have a chance to grade it. I'm still working out the grade. The grade. Um, I hope I got it I correct. Know what to show my grades. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's. I thought it was a pretty neat thing to do because it really tests your ability to uh, do all that. Okay, so I'm in student mode, so it says everything's everything's missing. The other thing I'm going to add to this is like your, your daily performance credit from the first part of class. Um, so, and then I have, um, I'll put together one other extra credit thing for you as well. Um, if I go to modules here, everything we've been doing in class from our workbook to all the presentations, um to note pages um it is here under modules right so um all kinds of the efi university book uh the the turbo catalog um some great tips for from elderbrock um i'll put together one last kind of extra credit thing for you related to this video clip right here um Hi, and welcome to another episode of Technic. Um, they, they do a good job on um, running a car on the dyno, doing some EFI tuning and showing you like what makes a bigger difference, fuel or ignition type of stuff. So um, anyways, you have those two tests to do. You have a couple of discussions. I'll be getting your grades put together shortly after that. And when you go to the grades tab, you will be able to see uh, what your grades are on here, okay? Um, and I'm still working on it. I just got my other class done and set up uh, yesterday. And so now I'm gonna start working, working on yours. And remember, you're gonna get credit from, from everything you did in class up to um, you know, March 18th or so when, when we ended our, our in-person class sessions and then all this stuff that we've done on the computer, okay? And you will get, you're not going to get it incomplete for this class. You are going to get a grade unless um, you individually chose to uh, withdraw from the class. Then you, what you would get would be a, um, uh, an excused withdrawal, okay? 
So, um, and, and even with that, although all you guys that have been participating are, are going to end up with, with good grades because you've been doing the activities and stuff. But um, if you went through there and you were like, oh, I, you know, I wanted a better grade than this, you could still, up until the end of the semester, choose to do that excused withdrawal. So you could still choose to, to take that option. Um, relating this all back to our schedule for the fall semester, guys. Um, like I said, we're going to have hands-on auto classes as it sits right now. We're going to be still having hands-on auto shop classes, but we are going to have less of those. We're probably, we're going to have five less sections of, um, hands-on classes. All the AT100 classes will be online. Um, all the hands-on classes will feature the lectures online and then we'll How would AT100 be completely online though, considering a lot of what I know. considered with Well, because it's not going to be ideal, Nathan, but the, the final decision was that something is better than nothing, right? So, yeah. That's, I, you know, the way we t normally taught AT100, it was very much online, or I'm sorry, very much in person working on the cars, right? And you were changing oil and stuff like that. Um, but Consume This River College, our sister college, uh, does theirs 100% lecture. And a lot of other schools do their basic auto shop classes, just like an information class, so it's done all lecture. So that we were kind of under the heavy pressure to do it all lecture. Um, and the, the logistics were, even with the size of our shop, we could not maintain social distancing requirements um, and run more than four classes at a time in the auto shop area, right? Basically, when you space it out, you're looking at 40 or 50 people tops in the whole auto shop compound to maintain social distancing. So with that, you know, we're, we're going to have, I don't know, four or five 18100 classes. They're going to be online. At least the students will get some information. And people that, you know, um, have the ability, they, they got a little um, garage or driveway at home or something, you know, they, they can do some maintenance on their car. The, the teacher will be there to assist them. Um, we're going to put some activities Couldn't together there where they still go be out like to a wide range of you go to their schedule, their though? neighborhood I O'Reilly do a do a battery test and so we're we're kind of thinking of some ways outside the box for them to do do it yourself or type stuff at their houses and get some information out of the class and remember that students from there they can take skill and speed they can do other things and I think if they go end up going through the whole program it'll all come out together in the end so. Um, anyway, so what do you guys need to do for this class? Do, do your two, do your two tests, um, finish any discussions or anything that you haven't done. And then, and then your grades will pop up on, on the, on the grades tab. And then in the, uh, following week, I'll get those submitted to district and it takes them a couple weeks, but then they should be available online. Um, and uh, other than that, I, I want you guys to stay safe and stay healthy and try not to be too cooped up at home or going crazy. Um, we're going to do a few online classes this, this summer. And like I said, hopefully I'll see you guys in maybe like inch performance. Um, it, Charlie, in asked, when is the schedule um, going to be the, online? The inch repair class. What's that? Charlie, me, asked, when is the schedule going to be out for fall? Oh, good question. All right, um, and I got the chat going up right here. So uh, it's supposed to be up May 23rd, but because I've had to do more, um, because I've had to do more revisions to it, that might be delayed slightly. Um, in fact, just as I was starting class, my dean sent me another revision to it. So it's supposed to be somewhere up between the 23rd and 25th. Um, that might be pushed back to like the uh, first week of June or something, but it's, it's coming out pretty soon. So, and remember the way American River College is going to work is all your normal classes that were just lecture only classes. Like let's say you're an English 300 or mathematics class or, um, you know, 
I don't know, um, U.S. history. All those types of classes will be taught online. Because we're career education, we've gotten a little bit of a, of a pass. So we're still going to be able to have, as it sits right now, this could change, but we're still going to have some um, hands-on classes. We're not going to have quite as many, and we're going to be social distancing those classes. So you guys will be working in smaller groups, uh, more one-on-one -on -one type of stuff. And it's gonna be a little different. I think it, it, it'll still be good. Um, uh, so as soon as you can sign up, try to try to sign up. I will be getting a hold of, once I get the schedule finalized, I will be getting a hold of like my various high school uh, counselors and, and teachers and stuff that I work with outside of ARC's district so they know what's going on. Um, it's gonna be a little bit of a compromise, but um, It'll, uh, yeah, I would expect Lonnie would want to know what's going on. For yeah, I'll let well. Lonnie know, uh, you know, because it's it's changed since I last talked to him. I think I talked to him like last week or maybe a week and a half ago, and it's changed yeah, since then. I know Charlie's graduating, um, but there's still going to be other Vision students coming into the program as well. Yeah. Yep. One other thing. Yep. So, I will guys, try to I find really, really appreciate the, uh, you guys I, I will try to find a link to the Audi SQ7 because I do okay. find it more interesting than Tesla's Model S, the way it's, it's just an innovation into how they're doing their force induction system. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, you know what's neat about this field is that stuff is changing all the time um, and it's constantly, uh, constantly evolving. So um, anyways, I've I've been really I've really enjoyed you guys um, continuing on with the class, and I'm glad we got a chance to finish it out because I won't be able to run this class in the fall, and I don't know what is going to be in store for the spring uh, schedule. So, um, anyways, I'm glad I'm glad we got to cover this stuff. Hopefully, I'll see some of you guys in the skill and speed class, and we can uh, do some dyno testing and stuff in there. Okay. Thank you so much. So with Mr. that. Frank. Yep. So with that, you guys stay safe um, and and keep learning and 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 uh, you know watching stuff and learning and, and and reading and working on as many things as you can. Okay. Everybody All take right. care. All right. And we'll see you. Thank we'll you, Mr. Bench. Oh, um, by the way, um, yeah. for the um, for nitrous, um, I found yeah. a little movie called Born to Race that does, that shows the nitrous system how it really works and it's really interesting. It's a little very, corny, but it's, cool. really, it's a really good movie to learn about the yeah. industry. So um, I'll tell you what we'll do is I'll, I'll put a general discussion thing so you can post that stuff up there because I would like to check that out. Okay? All right. All right. All right. Guys, well, see stay you later, Bye, okay? Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. All right. Bye.